Coming up on DTNS, why Apple's odd quarter is a preview of its future. How far can Netflix raise prices? And do you trust giving your fitness data to your insurance company? This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, spooky October 30th, 2020 in Spooky Angeles. I'm Don Merritt. <laughs> From Spooky Red Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Uh, drawing the top tech stories from Screamland, I'm Len Peralta. <laughs> and from Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. Ooh, Ooh spookiest uh, of all. And uh, I'm the show's producer, Roger Jane. Ooh. Hey. You sounded so enthusiastic. <laughs> Yeah, it is because yeah. I'm scared. This is what Roger does. Yeah. <laughs> if you want district. that wider conversation we have on the show, we were just talking about home maintenance uh, and the perils of changing fuses and replacing your appliances. Uh, it was a good time. Join us, uh, become a member, and get good day internet. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. The big tech companies all announced earnings Thursday with a few surprises. Facebook beat revenue and earnings projections. Alphabet had a profit of $16.40 per share, and revenue rose 14% after its first sales decline ever last quarter with 30 million paid music subscribers and 3 million YouTube TV subscribers. Twitter beat revenue and earnings expectations, including a $0.04 cents a share profit. Amazon revenue rose 37%. Apple had a decline in profits without a new iPhone in the quarter, but still beat expectations. If you want more details on earnings, keep up with the headlines at dailytechheadlines.com. Samsung has retaken the top spot for phone shipments worldwide, according to IDC, CounterPoint, and Canalys. Huawei had taken over the top for a quarter on strong sales in China because the rest of the world saw a dip in phone purchases. But Huawei's Q3 shipments dropped 7% and 24% year over year, putting them now in second place and Samsung back on top. Xiaomi grew 46% on the year and took over third, passing Apple, which dropped 7% and came in fourth. Five, six, and seven went to Oppo, Vivo, and Realme, but those are all BBK brands. And if you combine them all together and made a BBK entry here, BBK would be second and closer to Samsung than it would be to Huawei. Nikkei's sources say that Sony is in final negotiations to buy the anime streaming service Crunchyroll, which is currently owned by AT&T. The deal is reportedly valued at over 100 billion yen. That's about 957 million U.S. dollars. Crunchyroll currently has 70 million free users and 3 million paying subscribers with over 1,000 titles on the service. Under Armour announced it will sell MyFitnessPal to the investment firm Francisco Partners for $345 million and will also shut down the Endomondo fitness platform. Under Armour acquired both companies in 2015. The company will continue to own and operate the Map My Fitness platform, which includes Map My Run and Map My Ride, though. Instagram removed the recent tab from hashtag pages before the U.S. election in an effort to help stop the spread of what it calls harmful information. Hashtag pages on Instagram show top results and also recent results. Recent results show the latest content regardless of relevancy. Top results are ranked by popularity. All right, Rob, tell us a little bit more about that Netflix price rise. Yeah, well, Netflix has raised prices for U.S. users. Um, the standard plan, which includes two streams in HD, goes up $1 from $12.99 to $13.99 a month. The premium plan, which offers four streams in 4K, goes from goes up $2 from $15.99 to $17.99 a month. And the basic plan, which is a single non-HD stream, stays at $8.99 a month. Netflix raised its prices in the U.S. 22 months ago. I believe that was uh, January of 2019. Um, and, you know, the reason that they're doing this is they're saying that, you know, they, they want to continue to offer more variety of TV shows and films. Um, you know, they become a lot costlier is the, the big, I think, the big push for this. They become more costly. More services uh, need to compete for customers, um, you know, um, for high quality shows. CEO Reed Hastings said that in the last earnings call, the Netflix wants to have uh, so many hits that you know when you come to Netflix that you just go from hit to hit to hit to hit, and you never have to think about what those other services are offering. Yeah, it's getting bold expensive. Move. It's getting expensive. <laughs> well, with more competition, you would think prices would go down, right? Because you don't want to drive people to go use HBO Max or Peacock. Uh, but what Netflix is betting on is they can still raise prices a little bit without driving too many people away and take that money and make better shows that will even cause those people to can that canceled to want to come back because they'll right. be like, oh my gosh, that, that prestige show or that awesome new show is at Netflix now. 
I mean, that's what, you know, all these services, you know, they, I mean, if you're like Netflix or, or a, a few others, you're lucky enough to have a few hits, but just the one will be enough to, for example, Mandalorian. That's why I subscribe to Disney Plus, right? So that there can just be the one hit that someone says, all right, whatever the price is, I'll pay for it because I want this. $12.99 to $13.99 per month uh, for, you know, the, the standard plan. I mean, it's not... It's not the hugest increase ever, but yeah, if, if somebody is is looking at their monthly bill and figuring out, okay, of all the kind of cord cutting measures that I'm taking, is there really a hit that Netflix is giving me right now that makes this worth it? Well, depends on what you know you uh, consider a hit, but clearly the company wants to really double down on originals, not just a big uh, um, a big library of of old. TV shows and movies in order to have those hits that uh, make people not be able to leave. Yeah, I think that uh, it's definitely true what they say, that they want to um, offer more uh, variety of TV shows and give you a lot more original content. I absolutely believe that. But I also believe that they're somewhat opportunistic, that we're in a pandemic right now. Mm -hmm. And people's viewing habits have switched to they're just used to watching stuff on Netflix. So, you know, someone with a calculator sat down and figured out and made a guess on, I bet if we raise this up a couple bucks here, a buck there, that we are going to have some people who are going to churn off, but the people who stay, we're going to more than make up for it. So this was about just making more money for Netflix as much as it was for anything else, in my opinion. And if they do put that back into shows, I can see it working where instead of like, oh, when is Stranger Things back? There's always something on, right? Exactly. Right now, there's, there's, no matter who you are, there's a gap in Netflix, right? They've always got something new on, but it may not be for you. What they want to do is for most of their audience always have something new. We are like, Oh, I have to keep it. Cause I'm watching that thing. John Hancock is offering its life insurance customers an Apple watch series six for 25 bucks. But then you have a choice. You can pay the remaining cost of the watch monthly for two years or exercise more. Cause you got to share that data from the watch with John Hancock uh, and if you do exercise, you can reduce or even eliminate the monthly payment of the watch and keep it at just the original $25 you paid. The way it works, if you get 10,000 steps in a day, you get 20 points. Push that to 15,000 steps, you get 30 points. Uh, or you can meet some active calorie thresholds, and those vary by gender, height, and weight. Uh, so we don't know what those are exactly. You have to become a member to find all, all those details. But if you hit 500 points in a month, and your, then your monthly watch payment would be nothing. Uh, you won't pay anything. If you fall short of 500, you can still get part of your payment lowered uh, depending on how many points you do accrue. Now, a few other things to note on this. You can't get this deal in New York or Puerto Rico. You have to complete a health review to get life insurance. That's just normal. So it's not something that everybody can get because if you can't get the life insurance policy, you can't get the watch. If you're older than 71, you'll have lower thresholds. So they do say like, well, if, if you're older, we're not going to make you do 15,000 steps. Uh, you have to pay extra if you want the cellular connection. This is just for the GPS only. Uh, or if you want any special watch bands or case materials, they'll let you do that. But you have to pay the difference. The upshot is they want to encourage you to be healthier. They want to encourage you to exercise more, to get your steps in so you live longer, so they don't have to pay out your life insurance. Uh, John Hancock's vitality program that this is a part of uh, is not new. It's offered rewards with REI and Fitbit. Uh, in fact, three weeks ago, it announced it will offer the Amazon Halo Band. Uh, that'll be part of this as well. The program in general offers discounts on all kinds of things, hotels, purchases on Amazon. And it can be used, if you build up those points, to reduce the cost of life insurance premiums. So that's another part of this. If you're using the points to pay for the Apple Watch, you're probably going to use it to lower your premiums. But it really is mostly to encourage you to be healthier, because healthier people mean lower payouts. Oh man, where do I start? Uh, when I when I was kind of doing a deep dive on the story earlier, and as you mentioned in our pre-show meeting, Tom, this is not the first uh, time an insurance company has said, "Hey, we want to incentivize you to be healthier, and you get a kickback for that," you know, because we all win that way. But there is something there is something that I find very cringy about. Do you want the Apple Watch? Do you want it to be cheaper? Great. Okay, here's how you can do it. You want to take a bunch of steps? You agree to that? Great. Oh, shoot, you broke your ankle. Can't do that anymore. Now you got to pay. Uh, there are so many situations that come into play where 
somebody who is very well-meaning and not trying trying to game the system at all can't physically do what a company has now required them to do. On the surface, to me, this looks, oh, well, we just want you to be healthier, and if you want to be healthier, we'll, we'll give you a watch. Where this starts to break down, Sarah, I'm, I'm, I'm on the same page as you. What if you can't? Like, you know, I, I know that I am a candidate for knee replacement. Um, I would much rather ride a bike than get steps. Will that count? There are all those kind of things that come in. But the big thing for me is that what comes after this? Um, I think at some point these watches are going to be able to tell insurance companies whether or not they have, you know, their, their you know, their customers have pre-existing conditions. And, you know, is, is that going to be something that where they can determine whether they want to cover you or not? I mean, right now they legally have to. That may not be the case. You know, there's a Supreme Court ruling that's going to be coming here in the coming months that, uh, you know, may change some of that. So I'm concerned with what they might be able to do with this kind of data to determine whether or not they, they want to continue to cover you or not. Now, and it's worth reminding people out there, we're talking about life insurance here, not health insurance in this particular case. But broadly speaking, these kinds of incentives do happen with health insurance plans as well. So we're we're sort of overbroad to the specific case of John Hancock here in some respects. Uh, but I've got answers for both of you. One is, as I mentioned, you could do active calories instead of uh, steps. Uh, and there are even some other options like swimming and 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 uh, biking that you can you can have different options to meet the threshold. If you get sick and you just can't move at all, let's say you're in laid up in the hospital, then yeah, you're going to end up having to pay for the watch that month. Unless I don't know, maybe John Hancock can give you a special dispensation. Uh, but at that point, I guess the way that the life insurance looks at it is like, well, if you're laid up in the hospital, that's a you have a higher chance of dying, and we'd have to pay out. So. <laughs> You know, yeah, that's part of well, the deal. Well, it, 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 it's funny. It's like I and I was telling I was telling Tom and I, I think it was Scott Johnson and Roger the other day that my 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 Versa 2, my Fitbit that I wear all the time, it's been bothering me wearing it overnight. It didn't used to bother me. It was fine. But it just kind of I don't know. It feels restrictive. It's I, I wake up in the middle of the night and I want it off that kind of thing. There is a little bit of a monitoring situation here that I can understand a life insurance company saying like, well, we had a deal. <laughs> We're not getting the data we want from you. And a person being like, yeah, well, my life has changed. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's pretty convoluted. And listen, you don't have to do it either. Like this is an optional no, program. Of course. This is not, you know, they're not making you do this to get life insurance. They're saying, hey, if you want a cheap watch, this is a this is an incentive. A lot of people in our chat room are like, put it on your dog, uh, fake fake it, you know, well, uh, attach that. it to a chicken. Uh, those 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 are <laughs> right. those are. And the life insurance company is like, something is very wrong with yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. You know, if you put it on the dog, it's like this person walked in a circle nine thousand four hundred twenty-two yeah, times. We need to and hospitalize you. Get immediate. away with it. But if you get prosecuted for fraud, you're gonna regret that. So there you go. Uh, well, possibly good news from Google. Uh, if you like VPN services and you like Google services, the company added VPN to its top Google One storage subscription plans at no additional cost. So it'll show up in the Google One app when you turn it on and off and will work with anyone on a family plan as well. VPN is part of the two terabyte Google One plan, which is $9.99 per month or $99 per year, as well as the 10, 20, and 30 terabyte plans. They all cover this. Google One VPN is available for Android in the, in the U.S. with expansion to other countries, iOS, Windows, and Mac in the coming months. Uh, this is another thing they're adding to Google One. They they have some other things like photo storage and, and free backups of your Android phone that don't count against your cap and all kinds of cool stuff like that. So this is a, just another one they're throwing in there for, for your $9.99 a month uh, to try to get you on board to, to pay for that storage. I think long gone are the days where we all assumed Google Storage would be free. Uh, that that was an artifact of the 2000s. But but we don't necessarily want to pay someone for storage if we don't need it. If you're on Android, though, uh, or, or even on iOS, when, when it gets to the iOS app, uh, it's not a bad deal to get a terabyte or so of storage, a couple terabytes of storage and VPN. Yeah, this is something that I would actually uh, take a look at. Now, I... Now I don't, uh, you know, hide the fact that I am definitely into Google services and, uh, you know, I am an Android person, but I do pay for a third party VPN. Um, if I can get more storage, 
and pay roughly the same amount that I'm, you know, paying, um, you know, for the existing VPN for, you know, for Google's version of it and get more storage, that's actually kind of attractive. So it would at least make me think about it. Now, I don't know that I would just simply go out and switch, but if I were in the, you know, if I were looking to maybe get a VPN, this might be the way I would go just because it's bundled with other stuff. I mean, you have to trust Google, right? I mean, one of the things with picking a VPN, the reason I go with ExpressVPN isn't just because it's, you know, $100 a year, uh, which is equivalent, but it's because I've I've done some researching and vetting them. Uh, I Not that I don't trust Google as a VPN provider, but, you know, there is that aspect of like giving Google even more of your money and, and are they going to make sure that, I, I think I actually do trust that they would keep the VPN secure, but... I don't know. I, I sort of prefer an, an independent that's well vetted in this case. Yeah, Tom, I think that's why uh, I have friends like you to remind me. And you just said it in the most polite way. Rob, are you sure you want to get <laughs> Google more, more of your information? I'm not trying to tell you what to do, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> hey, folks, if you want to join the conversation in our Discord, which you can, uh, join by linking to a Patreon account. You can share your own VPN tips in there. Get, get on that. Join patreon.com slash DTNS. For a normal year, it was a bad quarter for Apple. You heard that uh, earlier when Sarah was was summarizing all the, the big tech earnings. Profit down 7% over last year, iPhone revenue down 21%. But for a coronavirus quarter, it was received well. Revenue overall for Apple was up 1%. And acknowledgement that the new iPhones didn't come along in this quarter like usual uh, meant that people were like, oh, okay, they normally have an iPhone in at least for part of the quarter, and they didn't this year. That's going to make a difference. This, I think, is also an early look at what life will be like in a world where phone sales just flatten out, uh, where people just aren't really buying phones all the time, similar to what we do with laptops and tablets now. Apple will be able to occasionally pick up the slack with occasionally peaks of its already flattened product lines. We have examples here. iPod revenue was up 46%. Mac sales up 28%. Those sales are a little juiced by lockdown needs where more people needed laptops and tablets than usual, and they won't always be there. But services is what Apple says is its future. And lockdown juiced or not, services picked up big time for falling iPhone revenue. 21% down in revenue in iPhone should have been a disaster, but they were up 1% overall. Why is that? Well, in part, it was services revenue being up 16.3%. They made $14.55 billion on services. That made it the number two revenue generator for Apple to the iPhone, which was $26.4 billion. Services recorded an all-time high of 585 million paid subscriptions, growing by 135 million year over year, on track to reach 600 million by the end of 2020. There was some bad news in here though. China was not good news. Uh, net sales grew year over year in every market except China. China revenue for Apple fell from 11.134 billion to 7.946 billion. But services is the future. They're not gonna make a whole lot on services in China because it's harder to do services in China. And Apple just launched its Apple One subscription plan, which bundles its subscriptions into monthly prices from $10 to $30 a month. They got three tiers in there. And that's going to bring in more subscribers as well and get people to pay a little more money. And they're not done there. CEO Tim Cook said on the earnings call, this year has a few more exciting things in store, I which can't everyone take assumes it. means can't. Apple Silicon. <laughs> I can't take it, Mr. Cook. I've had enough. Um, so a few things here. Tom, you, you, you said iPod. I know you meant iPad, but iPad revenue being up 46%. I was 46%, just pronouncing it like Spanish, iPod. Right, yeah, of yeah, course, sorry. I know. Well, you're, you're you know, you're, you're very, <laughs> Yes, you know. I meant iPad. Yeah, iPad revenue, just in case it confused anybody. iPad revenue being up 46%, Mac sales up 28%. Both of those are like, okay, people are at home. They're, you know, the, well, first of all, there wasn't a phone to buy. But even if there was, it's like, a new one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like we got to, you know, let, let's let's think about how we make the most of our current situation, because most people are hanging out at home much more than they had in the past. That makes sense to me. The numbers are pretty impressive, though. But I think that you bring up a good point about the phone sales flattening out. Flattening out, you know, and let's take the, you know, pandemic stuff even out of the equation. You just, you're going to get to a point, like you said, with laptops and tablets 
where enough people who want them have them, and they're only going to buy a new one if something goes wrong or, you know, three to four years go by. And you're just going to get slow in sales on that kind of uh, model. Yeah, I, th I think that is definitely the case when it comes to phones. If you think about, you know, smartphones, they've been around for a long time, but they really haven't been around for that long. And when they first came out, uh, every year or every other year, which is more, you know, people generally upgraded their phone every couple of years, what you would get in a new iPhone compared to what came out two years before was magic. And probably for the last three or four devices, that just hasn't been the case. Now, they, they absolutely are putting their, you know, their big toe into the camera. But the cameras are getting so advanced that people just aren't using that if they're not into, you know, really into photography. It's like, you know, um, and then a lot of photographers are still going to get their DSLRs, their mirrorless cameras and all that kind of stuff. So now your phone is just something that, well, when I need a new one, I'll get one. And, you know, I think of my, my wife. It's like, you know, her phone is up, but she doesn't want a new one. It's like the one I've got is just fine. There's no point in, you know, getting a new one. I'll have to learn how to use it. Let me just keep what I have until it, you know, until it's slow or until it doesn't work. So I, I think that is a big part of it. People's, uh, you know, just buying a new phone every year or every other year is just slowing down for them. They're getting them when they need new ones at this point. Yeah, the upgrade cycle is definitely slowing because it's it's now a big upgrade if you wait three or four years because there have been enough new features introduced in the intervening time. But if you go year to year, it's like, well, how is this much different than the one I had before? And that's what we see with tablets and laptops, et cetera. So service, that's why Apple pivoted to services years ago. Uh, and it takes a while to turn a ship that big. And this is an example that, well, that seems like they're turning it. You know, the Apple One subscription, before we move on, it is intriguing to me. I kind of did the math for me. I don't feel like I'm going to be saving a lot of money, but I have seen a lot of people online, especially talking about this, being like, yeah, I can save like 5 to $10 just by doing it this way rather than doing the a la carte stuff I've been doing with Apple over the years. And it'll keep people in because they won't want to cancel too. because of they've course. got so many things invested in it. And, and that's that's mm -hmm. really where you win with subscriptions. That's why they do bundles is not because they not because they want to save you money. It's because that wouldn't work, right? They'd make less money if everybody saved money. It's that you're less likely to cancel when it's multiple things in there. You're like, "Well, I don't need news anymore, but I do like music, and maybe I'll keep the TV." And then you might end up spending more over time than you would have if you only had one service and you're just like, yeah, I'll just get rid of that. I don't need it anymore. Also, when you bundle across your family, everybody mm -hmm. likes something different about oh, the yeah. service. So yeah. you can't get rid of any of it because someone there's all, you know, I think of, you know, uh, you know, that five family, you know, that five person family, there's always somebody who likes something in this and you can never get rid of anything. <laughs> where they get you. Well, Facebook announced that daily active users and monthly active users declined slightly in the U.S. and Canada, pointing to unusually high engagement numbers last quarter because of the pandemic. So, you know, people are moving on to other things. Meanwhile, WhatsApp now delivers 100 billion messages per day. Its yearly peak is usually on New Year's Eve. This past New Year's Eve, WhatsApp saw 100 billion messages. So WhatsApp is experiencing a New Year's Eve every day these days, it is really uh, experiencing quite a bit of growth, putting it ahead of all other messaging apps, including China's WeChat. In India, WhatsApp is the most popular of all apps on smartphones. Yeah, I look at this and I think, I wonder if this points toward people getting tired of Facebook itself. Uh, uh, I know it's just US nice? and Canada. I know it's just one quarter. But when you look at those WhatsApp numbers, you're like, well, it's not like people are stopping communicating with each other. They're communicating yeah. with each other more than ever. They just don't seem to want to do it on Facebook in the U.S. and Canada, especially around election time. You would have thought there would be more interest in, in talking about stuff. But uh, Roger pointed out in our pre-show meeting, he's like, he's been using it less because he's just tired of seeing all the people arguing. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. Um, th there's Facebook fatigue right now. People are just, just t okay, I, who, who am I going to go argue with today? Um, and it's like, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to argue. I'm just going to stay off the platform. Yeah, right. But then what, 100 billion messages a day. It's like we just throw that number out there. But that is literally getting everybody on Earth to do something 12 times. Yeah. <laughs> it, you know, in, in, in a day. Every two hours, everybody do this. And, and that's what's happening with WhatsApp. When you think about ah, 100 billion, that, that, that is a large, yeah. large number. They're having conversations. They're not just sending right. a message. Yeah, definitely. 
I also know that, you know, Facebook and Instagram, although, you know, Facebook owns Instagram, they're different beasts. But I wonder if there is just, there's less of, hey, look at this fun vacation I just took. Let me put a bunch of Facebook photos up there and get some likes. It's like, no, you're actually just communicating with people because that's what we're we're all kind of yearning for these days. And so it's just, it's a, it's a natural reaction to the state of the world. And luckily Facebook owns WhatsApp. So, you know, it, it, it wins either way. Yeah. We want to control who we talk to. That's what you do with WhatsApp versus let's put it out there for anybody who follows me, which is what you do on Facebook. Yeah. yeah. Now this news.com announced it's partnering with meditation app calm to create a live stream on election day in the U S that's on November 3rd, designed to help calm you. The live stream will include breathing exercises and other meditative activities with peaceful nature footage from all 50 states. See, very inclusive. It will go live at 5.30 p.m. Eastern time on November 3rd on Now This Is Facebook and YouTube pages and will continue throughout the following day as well. I get this as a publicity stunt, but uh, it's pretty genius to say, like, look, you're all going to start being stressed out as soon as polls close at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so let's give you an alternative. Instead of getting all, all you know, freaked out, do what Justin Robert Young was saying yesterday. Open the 12 county websites that actually matter in swinging this election and then put on a calm, <laughs> soothing <laughs> channel and just relax for a little instead of getting all hyped up. I won't be shocked at all if they extend this beyond. <laughs> the, 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 I think a day and a half is what they're going to give you. The people they're demand like, more meditation. Yeah, we're going to give we're going to give you till mid November. <laughs> we yes, need more of it. They start de demanding calm. <laughs> you know, give us more calm. I need breathing help. Yeah. Uh, folks, uh, you can email us feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And then we look in our mailbag, which is virtual. And uh, Sarah picks a couple of things to talk about. Indeed. This one comes from Dwayne in Germany. Dwayne says, you mentioned in a previous show that U.S. companies will be able to sell to Huawei except for 5G. Wow. What does that mean? Dwayne asks. Dwayne says, me and my wife have Huawei phones and I'm about to buy the Mate 40 Plus Pro, Pro Plus for myself. My wife is a photographer, so we always go with Huawei because we like their cameras. Does this mean we'll soon see GPS on Huawei again? If not, I'm still getting the Mate 40 Pro Plus. I just wish everyone pushed the tech to the limit like Huawei. Their phones are always top notch. Dwayne, do you work for Huawei? Because you're really into Huawei. But uh, <laughs> either way, whether you do or not, uh, it's a good question. I should have said 5G infrastructure to make it clearer uh, because what they're saying is you can now apply for a license will approve some licenses to sell chips to Huawei if you're not if they're not going to use them for their 5G infrastructure so their switches uh, their networking equipment for implementing 5G service. That's what the U.S. is concerned about. And this is turning a corner because it's the U.S. saying, we're not just trying to squash Huawei anymore. We really are just trying to keep their 5G infrastructure from being built out because that's where the security concerns the U.S. has lie. They, they're not worried about security in the handsets. They're worried about it in the network infrastructure. And to your point about the image sensor, Dwayne, I have some good news. Sony and Omnivision, the world's two leading camera image sensor providers have been granted licenses, according to Nikkei.com, by the U.S. government to resume shipments to Huawei. Uh, so the image sensors will, will be good in future Huawei handsets because of this. Uh, Samsung Display had previously received permission to ship OLED screens, not Samsung chips, but OLED screens, and Intel and AMD have resumed some undisclosed shipments, uh, but we don't know which kinds. We don't have any news about MediaTek or Qualcomm, which would be the modems that go into Huawei. Uh, we don't know that they can get chips from Intel and AMD to replace the Snapdragon. So if Qualcomm gets a license to do this, then yeah, Huawei's back in business. As Tom mentioned, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send those emails. Not going to get into it until the post show, but two, not one, but two photos of bearded dragons. Uh, <laughs> I could not thank you more. <laughs> You're all wonderful people. Also, shout out to our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Paul Reese, Ragnald Barmadal, and Jeff Wilkes. Let's check in with Len Peralta, who has been illustrating today's show. What have you drawn for us, Len? Well, you know, we're a day away from Halloween, obviously. Four days away from the uh, from the U.S. election, and you kind of mentioned uh, that there's going to be some a lot of zen going on uh, mm. after the election. 
Uh, but there is a lot of scary stuff. 2020 is a horror show. We don't need to tell you that, everybody. You know, Netflix raising their prices, even though nobody has money to afford it. Apple profits are down. Uh, Car Kanye Kardashian hologram is trending. Uh, Halloween more or less canceled. We've been locked down for nine months. Tom and I have turned 50 this year. Ah! Please make it stop, everybody. Make it stop. And uh, that's what this image is all about. Sort of on the brink of something really scary, not only Halloween, but just the U.S. in general, folks. It's scary out there. Stay safe. And uh, you can pick up this uh, this print at my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len, or at my online store, lenperaltestore.com. Spooky. Ooh, scary. Very Spooky. scary. Very scary. Good work, Len. Um, you. you know, yeah, I mean, even though you called out Tom's age. but <laughs> I called know, my I age out, too. Len yeah, looks exactly. like 30. But yeah, Y'all look very young. Uh, speaking of looking young, thanks to Rob Dunwood for being with us today. Rob, what's been going on in your world? Not a whole lot. Still hunkered down, trying to stay safe from the, uh, you know, from the pandemic. But uh, folks can reach me um, at all things at Rob Dunwood. And definitely check out my podcast at the smrpodcast.com. Yeah, go check it out, folks. It's a good time. There was a, a chicken wings and beer episode this week. Always a good time. And uh, Chris Ashley even insisted on talking woodworking, even though Rod wasn't there. So my apologies on behalf of the audience, Rob. <laughs> SMRpodcast.com. Uh, folks, if you want DTNS as a video podcast, get the video RSS feed at dailytechnewsshow.com slash subscribe. You can always support our show at any level at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. We are live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Join us if you can. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back on Monday. Have a spooky weekend. Yay. See you later. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. The Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>